Я открыла глаза. У меня ноги пекут сильно. I opened my eyes and felt my legs burning. I didn't know what happened. I wanted to get up, but I couldn't. I was crying. I was scared. And then I tried to lift my legs. And I didn't understand. I couldn't see where they were. They were gone. There was blood. But there were no legs. In order to stop Vladimir Putin's war machine, we need to reflect on the old expression, follow the money. Today we're going to examine how Vladimir Putin is paying for all the rockets, tanks, guns and other military equipment that his army is using to attack the people of Ukraine. Second, we're going to look at some of the underhanded tricks that Putin has used to get much of the world addicted to Russian oil and natural gas. And third, we're going to look at what Canada can do to help stop Putin. On April 8, 2022, Russia's rockets hit the Kramatorsk railway station in northeast Ukraine. Thousands of people were waiting for trains, hoping to flee the country. Women, children, senior citizens, families. The rocket blast killed over 50 Ukrainians and injured over 100 people. Yana Stepanenko was there with her mother Natalia, and they were buying tea at the station when the rockets hit. Yana lost both her legs during the attack, and her mother lost one of her legs. Miraculously, her brother wasn't harmed. To make matters worse, her father died a month later, fighting for his country. Putin's invasion and his attack on Ukraine has robbed 11-year-old Yana of her childhood innocence. The physical trauma will affect her for the rest of her life, as will the emotional scars. Sadly, Yana's story is one of countless atrocities that have happened in Ukraine. Media have reported on Putin's forces raping women and children, Russian soldiers stealing young kids and transporting them back to Russia, Ukrainian people being mutilated and tortured. Since the invasion began, there have been over 6,000 civilians killed. Almost 8 million Ukrainians have fled their country. Apartment buildings, houses, schools, hospitals and businesses have been damaged or destroyed. The cost to rebuild Ukraine is over $1 trillion Canadian. That's more than double what our federal government spends in an entire year here in Canada. This senseless war has been brutal for the Ukrainian people, but it has also affected the rest of the world. From the price of food in grocery stores to the cost of filling up cars with gasoline, Putin's actions have made life more difficult for people around the globe. So how is Vladimir Putin paying for the rockets, tanks, drones, and other equipment he's using to inflict pain on the Ukrainian people? In short, he's been selling oil and natural gas to many other countries for years. According to the Paris-based International Energy Agency, almost half of Russia's budget comes from selling natural gas and oil. By chance, I ran into a Ukrainian member of parliament at an international conference in the United States recently. I asked him about this problem and he thinks that Russia's oil and gas play an even larger part of their budget. Uh, it's actually much more. So Russia's economy has always remained basically just a big gas station, right? It has not managed to modernize. It's just relying almost entirely on uh, natural gas uh, and oil revenues. To get a second opinion, we spoke with Shuv Majumdar, director of the Foreign Policy and National Security Program at the McDonald Laurier Institute. When I think about Russia today geopolitically, if it's a, indelicate to say it, it's not a thriving, expanding, growing economy. Russia today is uh, essentially a gas station. Russia is the largest supplier of natural gas to Europe. For example, prior to the war, Austria, Germany, Finland, Hungary, and many other European nations depended on Russia for more than half of their natural gas. What Vladimir Putin has fashioned across Europe is a campaign to create energy dependency. He has run a massive elite capture campaign hiring former European politicians. He has uh, created a concept of reliance on Russian gas uh, that you know a lot of European politicians have fallen for over the last 10, 15 years. While Europe has been a top customer for Russia, even Canada and the United States have purchased oil from Putin's regime. 
It may be hard to believe, but right now there are eight super tankers filled with Russian oil headed our way. They're coming into New York, New Jersey, Louisiana, and Houston. The West has unknowingly paid for the tanks and rockets that are currently attacking Ukraine. Once the war began, many countries took action to impose sanctions on Russia, such as trade bans on some Russian goods, and Russian oligarchs had their assets frozen. But one thing many European nations have struggled with is stopping their purchases of Russian oil and natural gas. Some argue the world should transition to renewable energy, but the situation is not so simple. Wind, solar, and hydrogen are growing in popularity, and that's good for consumers because it increases competition. However, we need to be realistic. Those sources only make up about 2% of the world's energy supplies. And keep in mind, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. These energy sources have their own shortcomings. According to the US Energy Information Administration, we're going to see renewables grow in the future but the world will continue to use oil and natural gas products for decades to come. Think about why this is the case. Natural gas heats our homes, our workplaces and schools. We cook our meals with it and many power plants use it to create electricity. Similarly, gasoline, diesel and other oil products power our cars and they fuel the semi-trucks and ships that transport the products we buy in stores. Many of the things we use are actually made of oil and natural gas such as the plastics in our cell phones, the soles of our shoes and bicycle tires, to name just a few. Billions of people would starve to death if it wasn't for fertilizers that are made with natural gas. So if we can't simply transition to renewables, then why don't countries buy their oil and natural gas from other suppliers instead of Russia? One reason is that Vladimir Putin has been working behind the scenes to sabotage his competitors. Several media sources have reported that Putin has been funding environmental groups in other countries. Now, why would he do this? Because if he can help an environmental group block an oil and gas project in another country, then more people have to buy oil and natural gas from Putin. He's essentially taking out his competition. The Hill.com noted, Putin and his cronies helped fund the anti-shale gas propaganda that led seven European countries to ban fracking. Fracking, of course, is a term that describes a method for developing natural gas. Consider this article from The Guardian. In 2014, they noted that the Secretary General of NATO said that Russia, quote, engaged actively with environmental organizations working against shale gas to maintain European dependence on imported Russian gas. Republican Congressman Lamar Smith and Randy Weber say that Russia is working with American environmental groups to spread misinformation about hydraulic fracturing. Fracking, it's called. The goal? Get it banned, fracking banned in the US. Even Hillary Clinton has commented on this problem. Leaked emails from her assistant indicate that behind closed doors, she said, quote, we were even up against phony environmental groups. And I'm a big environmentalist, but these were funded by the Russians to stand against any effort. Oh, that pipeline, that fracking, that whatever will be a problem for you. And a lot of the money supporting that message was coming from Russia. It's not clear if any Canadian environmental groups received money from Russia, but one can imagine Putin cheering for the radical environmentalists who used axes and other weapons to attack pipeline workers in British Columbia. These radicals also destroyed equipment and caused significant damage to the worksite. So Russia has become an expert in disinformation around the world. Uh, Russia is agnostic about which extreme it wants to polarize further. What it wants to sow is discord in the, in the Western world and in the democratic alliance. Well, Canada does have the resources to help. We have the third largest oil reserves in the world and significant amounts of natural gas. The world could be buying from Canada instead of Vladimir Putin's Russia. But the problem is we don't have enough pipelines to our coast to ship our resources outside of North America. According to the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, essentially all of Canada's oil and natural gas exports go to one customer, the United States. SecondStreet.org spoke with Crystal Wittevrongel with the Montreal Economic Institute about the situation. We don't have the pipeline capacity to be able to just flip a switch and up our, our our exports or our production to the levels at which are necessary and are beneficial 
it's a lack of infrastructure that we're really facing. Over the past eight years, the federal government has made it very difficult to ship our oil and natural gas resources over to Europe and Asia. Today, we are also announcing that the Government of Canada has directed the National Energy Board to dismiss the application for the Northern Gateway Pipelines project. They introduced a ban on tanker traffic in Northern BC, and they put in place barriers to essentially block the Energy East pipeline. Quebec's provincial government has opposed new pipelines running through their territory, and they've blocked businesses from developing local natural gas deposits. Michael Binion, the CEO of Quest Air, has been trying to develop natural gas in Quebec for over a decade. What we proposed to the government was to use hydroelectricity to produce near zero emissions natural gas, and then to even go to our industrial customers who are making LNG and other products and capture their CO2 and recycle it or sequester it under the ground. So that it was a zero emissions production, but also near zero emissions consumption. Certainly very, very competitive with wind and solar on an emissions profile. The government still said no. Critics will argue that even if we did approve new projects immediately, it would still take a long time before they could be built and make a difference in Europe. And they're half right. These projects can't be built overnight. However, we could be like Germany and fast track new projects. They just built a brand new facility to receive natural gas in record time, just 194 days. According to energyconnects.com, the completion in 194 days represented an unprecedented pace of construction facilitated by the German government. Even if we can't build pipelines quite as quickly, we need to remember that the world isn't just facing a short-term problem with Europe facing a long cold winter and the current war in Ukraine. We're also facing a long-term problem. If Vladimir Putin pulled out all his forces from Ukraine tomorrow, would you want to be buying your energy from him a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? The answer is obvious. The world fundamentally needs new energy suppliers and Canada could be part of the solution. So Canada has the resources and we have the public support to actually increase our production and export, but the political situation is really the big question mark. Secondstreet.org surveyed oil and gas experts to ask them how much of Russia's natural gas and oil sales could Canada steal if we exported more of our resources. Within a year, we can only do a little bit. However, by the end of the decade, we could grow our exports to replace upwards of 59% of Russian natural gas sales. That would take a huge bite out of Russia's military budget. In terms of crude oil, Canada could replace about 46% of Russian exports. If other countries increased production of their resources, Russia would face an even greater squeeze. According to Inserva, an industry association that represents companies in the oil and gas sector, their members are ready to step up. Why not help our neighbours in Europe and help them with Canadian resources versus them turning to other countries? When the German Chancellor was here and we said, maybe, not really, there's not a business case for this, they went straight to Australia and then went to the Middle East and said they're going to find a solution, so why not a Canadian-made solution? We also found support for this idea in First Nations circles. Stephen Buffalo is the president of the Indian Resource Council. We're at the point where we're seeing issues of countries not having energy, you know, to, to, to meet uh, some of the needs coming into this winter. You know, that's, that's awfully scary as well. And I think, again, Canada ha has an opportunity to play a big role here. You know, not only hydrogen can we give, you know, a country such as Germany, we can give them liquefied natural gas. And, and uh, Canada should be a leader in providing that natural resource, uh, natural resources in, forms, in all forms of energy. It's not just people that work in industry that support this idea. Everyday Canadians support it too. We hired Leger to poll Canadians on this issue and found 72% support the idea of Canada exporting more oil and gas products so the world doesn't have to keep buying from Russia. Well, Canada is a major player on global energy markets. So, quite honestly, the more oil Canada produces, the better it is for the world and for the So what's the holdup? Well, again, it's politics. If Canada increased our output of oil and natural gas, we would see an increase in emissions, at least in the short term. And this has some politicians concerned. But consider these three points. First, we need to think beyond our borders. The goal should not be so much focused on Canada's emissions, 
but on how Canada affects global emissions. For instance, if a country stopped buying natural gas from Russia and bought from Canada instead, it's basically the same amount of emissions, just coming from a different place. In fact, we would likely see a drop in emissions because here in Canada, our methods for developing natural gas are much more environmentally friendly than they are in Russia. The second thing we need to remember is that after Germany took a stand against Russia, Putin responded by cutting their natural gas shipments. This meant that in order to avoid freezing this winter, Germany had to reopen coal power plants that they had previously shut down. Remember, CO2 emissions from coal are about twice as high as they are from natural gas. So if Canada exported more natural gas to Germany, they could shut down some of their coal plants and reduce their emissions. Other countries have also tried to buy natural gas from Canada. India is a good example. If we exported our natural gas to India, it could reduce its dependence on coal power plants and reduce emissions. Third, imagine if governments in Canada took some of the billions of tax dollars that they would receive from new oil and natural gas projects and used those dollars to help develop new technology to reduce emissions. Entrepreneurs have already found a way to capture CO2 from smokestacks, recycle it, and turn it into useful products, such as diamonds, vodka, soap, materials for making bicycle frames, blue food coloring, and more. Canada could help entrepreneurs develop more technological breakthroughs such as these, ultimately reducing emissions. Industry believes that Canada can still meet its emission targets while expanding production. There's a misconception that if we start producing more and um, providing the world with more energy, Canadian energy, that we're going to miss our own net zero targets. And that's just not the case. We can still provide energy to the rest of the world while meeting and exceeding our own net zero targets. As you can see, the world is going to continue to use oil and natural gas products for decades to come. Canada has these resources and Canadians support selling the world the resources that it needs, but we're stuck because of politics. It is bothersome that we have people not able to take a side to help because they're trapped. I have to have energy from Russia, yet I want to stand with Ukraine. And so it's hard to see that, that people can't really maybe take the stand they want to. They, I stand with Ukraine, but it's difficult for me to fully stand with Ukraine. And, and it feels to me Canada should help. Uh, we should be making it that people can make that stand. Putin's invasion has caused immense devastation, but the Ukrainian people have inspired the world with their resolve and determination to survive. Young Yana Stepanenko is no different. Since the brutal rocket attack in April, she has received prosthetic limbs and rehabilitation support in the US. Just as Yana is once again taking her first steps, Canada needs to decide which steps we will take. Do we stand up and help the world wean itself off of Russian oil and natural gas? Or do we keep our resources in the ground and let the world stay dependent on tyrants like Vladimir Putin.